Back to six, is that right? Yeah. Would you agree the basic metaphysics of Plotinus is just this model? He has, of course, other ones. He has the tree, and he has strings, and he has examples of returning to the source. But structurally speaking, uh, the one, right, the one does something curious. Right? It, uh, it overflows. And in the overflowing, it becomes the intelligence. And returning, you see, the whole mystery metaphysically is right here. When it returns, And in returning, and as a consequence of returning, at that point of its return, it recognizes. That is to say, it sees. And it must see and encounter something. Hence, what it sees becomes the act of seeing and its proper object. And therefore, its seeing is an intellectual seeing, right? It's a seeing with the mind. And since it encounters something, it's really intelligence being. Right? So, in the sixth, he raises this question, as you can see in this beautiful picture. What's that, Paul? Uh, and, uh, and yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, I remember those days. <laughs> how, how does, see, how does the intelligence sit? Right, that's his first question, right? Yes. What does it say? How does it exist? And issue from the one in order to sit. And we could add a, a line to it. Uh, that's what I want to do. 
Um, I'm down in the middle of that. Uh, ten lines up from the bottom. What is begotten by the one must be said to be begotten without any motion on the part of the one. So while this has the overflows is a motion, I'm saying, by the way, that's only speaking metaphorically, obviously. It's metaphorically speaking. So we can say the one motionless produces uh, that which turns upon itself uh, turns about to see its arm. All right, so the one motionless produces that which turns about to see its own art. Right now, just to change it while motionless, how <coughs> can it be the cause of all motion? Or that which is in motion. Or it's motionless. Okay. Put it in another way. The uh, This is a, actually a koan that comes from the select writings of Finsky's third aunt. Third aunt? Yeah. <laughs> I thought you'd recognize you by now. Finsky was her darling successor. <laughs> See that? Mm -hmm. yeah, how can I do something? Six, seven, what? 
from six on. He's, he's doing the come on. Isn't it? Pardon me. Hmm? No. Structurally, this is the, the three primal hyperstations. One, intelligence being the soul. Now, notice that this and what he's doing in six is really asking for this. How are they connected? Now, what he's really doing is saying, look, talk about this, you have to talk about its relationship with one to the other. That relationship is important. <clears throat> and he can do, and so can the Buddhists, in another way, they can do it on the next level as well. What's the connection between these two? And if you talk about that connection, I think what you're involved in is one of these animals. How? It's a how. No. So, um, the interesting thing, of course, about the Buddhists is that They want to reduce this in, right? They reduce this metaphysics in terms of mind, clearly. Right. Just forthright by mind, Buddha, Buddha nature, mind. So therefore, it has an interesting psychological dimension that we can appeal to. The Plinus has it too. But he is, he wants to capture the structure, too. He wants to save the structure. Buddhists want to avoid that because that's a taboo. Yeah. Why is it a taboo? Pardon? Why is it a taboo? Because historically, when the Buddha laid down the doctrine, he said metaphysics should be avoided. So that they take their metaphysics, they can put it into the problem of the mind. We'll take the statements about the mind and say, fine, that's a very nice insight. We'll take it cosmically or metaphysically. Right up, you're all familiar with that, you know, the story of the Buddha. The guy is wounded by an arrow. It's the important thing is to get the arrow out. Don't try to figure out where the arrow came from and who shot it and how fast it flew and from what point in the world it landed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Get it out. That's what, you know, avoid all discussion because that have nothing to do with other taking that arrow. So, yeah, but discuss how to take it out, though. Yeah, well, I, that, 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 that part of the story, they didn't, <laughs> they avoided it. Well, they got some kind of barb you push it through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You may be able to do a better job if you know where it came from, and the flight, and the path, and all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if that was original Buddhism or some kind of reaction to kind of the English empiricist kind of thing. Very early, this very early Buddhism. Mm. That's the early, well, very early, before before it got to China. Because mm. they're the people who started going into Taoism and the the, the interesting stuff they had. So. Uh, 
if we uh, re read it through again from six on, we can move from here, here, to here. Yeah. And Paul will say, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe. Oh, Not after last week, he won't say that. <laughs> no, he'll sure say, uh, <laughs> No, could be. I hope so. Uh -huh. you? Oh, you hope so. Oh. So, that's perhaps it. Anyone want a cup before we run to work? Yeah. Might still be so I have to get my pen. Is it still ready. going? It's ready? ready? Great. Okay. It would be nice to have a copy of it because one is very hard to read. <laughs> the metaphysics of the crackles. Are you seeing it? Are you seeing it? Yeah. He drew it. <laughs> 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 oh, I see. But I don't know what you mean. Yeah. Oh, I see. But she knows, probably intuitively, that I don't have a copy myself. <laughs> yeah. well, and it's so nice that Carol does. It's a nice like job of copy. Yeah. 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 Really nice embellishment. Did you say you need the copy machine? <laughs> yeah. That reminds me of, of the story of Captain Zero with Golden West Colin. He was dreaming about writing a book. He's going to get a book. And I, every once in a while I have fun with him. So, you know, when you write it. So one day I came running up to him and he said, Hey, interesting happened. He said, giving this class, and walking back and forth, you know, I noticed that you're really intelligently taking them. After class, I went to school, and I said, blah, 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 blah. She said, oh, yes. <coughs> and uh, he said, may I see? And she said, oh, yes. So she showed him. And I said, oh, you're going to start your book now, huh? He said, yeah. She wrote down everything, went home and typed it all. And all he had to do was get a copy of her notes at the end of the semester, and he had the beginning of his book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was his book. <laughs> <laughs> so I met him a short while later, and uh, he, you know, I said, what's my account, Darren? He said, up yours, in another kind of language. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, come on, what, what was that? He says, what I found is this down there. He said, you know my joke she put down. Uh, everything. Every, not, not, just no discrimination at all went down. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's too much Everybody work. was getting it reflective, you know, and summarized neatly. And now she was right down there. So he had to do more work than he had yeah. anticipated. Yeah, that's terrible. He told me she'd go to a university and work there and then get his graduate students to do it. So, what do you think, folks? Jump into six and charge through? I think we could do it all five since we've done it before. All the way through the end. Well, we've been there. We've been there six last time, six and seven, right? We didn't get through seven, I don't think. No, we didn't get through seven. It stopped on 399. We have a About Tommy, you got Tommy? Yeah. You in this one? Yeah. Hi, Mom. Did you pull us in on whatever? Oh, I have a shirt. You do? Yeah, I'm going to see it. I always love the other two at the same time.
Yeah, we're waiting for me. <laughs> I thought they were waiting for you. I was waiting for you. <laughs> how then does it see? And whom does it see? And how did it come into existence at all and rise from the one so as to be able to see? For the soul now knows that these things must be, but longs to answer the question repeatedly discussed also by the ancient philosophers. How from the one, if it is such as we say it is, anything else, whether a multiplicity or a dyad or a number, came into existence? And why it did not, on the contrary, remain by itself? But such a great multiplicity overflowed from it as that which is seen to exist in beings, but which we think it right to refer back to the one. Let us speak of it in this way, first invoking God himself, not in spoken words, but stretching ourselves, but stretching ourselves out with our soul into prayer to him, able in this way to pray alone to him alone, the contemplator then, since God exists by himself, as if inside the temple, remaining quiet beyond all things, must contemplate what correspond to the images already standing outside the temple, or rather that one image which appeared first. And this is the way in which it appeared. Everything which is moved must have some end to which it moves. The one has no such end, so we must not consider that it moves. If anything comes into being after it, we must think that it necessarily does so, while the one remains continually turned toward itself. When we are discussing eternal realities, we must not let coming into being in time be an obstacle to our thought. In the discussion, we apply the word becoming to them in attributing to them causal connection and order, and must therefore state that what comes into being from the one does so without the one being moved. For if anything came into being as a result of the ones being moved, it would be the third starting from the one, not the second, since it would come after the movement. So if there is a second after the one, it must have come to be without the one moving at all, without any inclination or act of will or any sort of activity on its part. How did it come to be then? And what are we to think of as surrounding the one in its repose? must be like, it must be a radiation from it while it remains unchanged, like the bright light from the sun which, so to speak, runs round it, springing from it continually while it remains unchanged. All things which exist, as long as they remain in being, necessarily produce from their own substances, dependence, <coughs> Independence on their own, me, independence on their present power, 
a surrounding reality directed to what is outside them, a kind of image of the archetypes from which it was produced. Fire produces the heat which comes from it. Snow does not only keep its cold itself inside itself. Perfume things show this particularly clearly. As long as they exist, something is diffused from themselves around them, and what is near them enjoys their existence. <coughs> and all things, when they come to perfection, produce. The one is always perfect and therefore produces everlastingly, and its product is less than itself. What then must we say about the most perfect? Nothing can come from it except that which is next greatest after it. <coughs> intellect is next to it in greatness and second to it. The intellect sees it and needs it alone, but it has no need of intellect. And that which derives from something greater than intellect is intellect, which is greater than all things, because the other things come after it. And soul is an expression and a kind of activity of intellect, just as intellect is of the one. But soul's expression is obscure, for it is a ghost of intellect, and for this reason, it has to look to intellect. But intellect in the same way has to look to that God in order to be intellect. But it sees him not as separated from him, but because it comes next after him, and there is nothing between, as also there is not anything between soul and intellect. Everything longs for its parent and loves it, especially when parent and offspring are alone. But when the parent is the highest good, the offspring is necessarily with him and separated from him only in otherness. That's really nice. I enjoy the difference in the metaphors. <coughs> Second paragraph to see the one. This is all one paragraph. Okay. Uh, no, it would be the yeah, you know, uh, 15 the lines down. Time at the beginning of six. After a long day, to see the one that remains in itself. <clears throat> the inner sanctuary. Yeah, the inner sanctuary. <coughs> the contemplator then. Yeah. To say no God. The contemplator then, since God exists by himself as if inside the temple, remaining quiet beyond all things, must contemplate what correspond to the images already standing outside the temple. Yeah. <coughs> Do that again. Again. Mm -hmm. uh. The contemplator then since God exists by himself as if inside the temple, remaining quiet beyond all things, must contemplate what correspond to the images already standing outside the temple. Right, must contemplate the images mm -hmm. uh, outside. Right, watch the language. Mm -hmm. right. Now this is the part I, I enjoy must contemplate what correspond to the images already standing outside the temple, or rather that one image which appeared first. Okay, what is it? That one image. Right, that appeared first. Okay. And this is the way in which it appeared. <coughs> this is the way in which it appeared. Thank you. 
the way the image appeared. It's the first images in the outer precinct of the inner sanctuary of the one. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. First thing is. Oh, okay. It's not an image. Go ahead. Everything which is moved. Good. First image is the principle of philosophy. Ah. Right? Mm-hmm. Certainly you encountered that in the papers, too. First image being the model. Right. First image. First image. You might say is 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 the metaphysics of the one. Listen. It's not an image. It's it's metaphysics. Is it not? Mm -hmm. Two forty-five. The papers, right? It's the process, right? This seeing. <coughs> no. No. That, if just read the next part. Mm-hmm. And this is the way in which it appeared. Right. Everything. This is the way in which it appeared. It appeared. It, it appears. But it's really interesting. Okay, now what is it that appears? Everything which is moved must have some end to which it moves. It's better physics. <coughs> That's. Did you bring the papers? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. But that which is ever moving is immortal, that which moves something else, or is moved by something else, when it ceases to move, ceases to move. Only that which moves itself, since it does not leave itself, never ceases to move. And this is also the source and beginning of motion, for all other things which uh, have motion. Right, the whole discussion of this thing, that he's calling is the, the first figure is outside, just outside the sanctuary of the, the precinct. Is that kind of reflection of motion? It's motion, then. Well, it's a discussion of motion. It's a discussion of the nature of the one being motion. And it has all of those elements in it. So, uh, you certainly <laughs> place the philosophy in a lovely place, isn't it? Oh, you're, you're fooling. At least the guy probably and memorized this, he's it. And this is going to buy the telephone. He's memorized it. He doesn't need the text. Two forty-five. Checking something. Two forty-five. checking something else? Yes. Okay, fair. Let us know when you get it. Though. Is it to reason discursively? Well, you tell us. What do you say? Well, I see on page 69 a sentence that says, for the intelligence to reason discursively is to descend to its lowest level rather than to rise to the level of the existence beyond. Yeah. And the existence beyond the one is, say, the one. And if it's like the ones inside this inner sanctuary, then it would seem it's that... It's outside. Oh, the ones outside the inner sanctuary? Mm. To see the one that remains in itself self as if in an inner sanctuary, uh-huh. undisturbed and remote from all things. Uh, uh, keep going. Uh, we must consider that. We must first consider the images in the outer precincts. Right. So the outer Outside precincts. Outside of the inner sanctuary. Yeah. And so I'm thinking outer precincts go, go into the realm of the intelligence. Mm. Seems to me that 
and that's mm-hmm. tied in with the principle of philosophy, then okay. there's something about the one intelligence and the connection between the intelligence and the one mm-hmm. relates to that passage. Yeah, don't throw it away when um, you're talking. Yeah. It relates to this passage describing the descent, how the intelligence descends to its lowest level. So you might say, to keep the example down, uh, in its outermost precinct, you would like, you would like to pick up that thing? <coughs> you would like that translation of the Greek to have its outermost precinct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's one. Yeah, it's one. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. What's the answer to the question, then? <coughs> How does the intelligence see? What does it see? How does it exist and issue from the one in order to see? It's nice, isn't it? Isn't it? See what he does? See, he pulls it over to this model. He so clearly puts it in terms of a, a model for contemplation that that language runs through the whole thing. And he continues it, keeps the same images working. Therefore, it's much richer in that respect. <clears throat> Could you read it again, yeah. Rod? Therefore, that the beholder of him, being in himself, as if in the interior part of the temple, and quietly abiding in an eminence beyond all things, should survey the statues, as it were, which are established outwardly, or rather, that statue which first shined forth to view, and after the following manner behold that which is naturally adapted to be beheld. With respect to everything that is moved, it is necessary. There should be something to which it is moved. For if there is nothing of this kind, we should not admit that it is moved. But if anything is generated posterior to that which the movable nature tends, it is necessary that it should always be generated in consequence of that prior cause being converted to itself. Oh, that's clear. He's got his homework Yeah. With respect to everything that is moved, it is necessary there should be something to which it is moved. For if there is nothing of this kind, we should not admit that it is moved. But if anything, is generated posterior to that to which the movable nature tends, 
it is necessary that it should always be generated in consequence of that prior cause being converted to itself. Yeah, that's nice. That's mm -hmm. nice. Mm -hmm. Or could you see the way All right. writing previous to that? It's like a Buddhist. It's like a Buddhist term. Right. It's like instructions from another thing. Right, unless there's the, the the reflecting back, there isn't itself. Right. Until that occurs, there isn't itself. It isn't itself intelligence. Right. Correct. It's the one, but it's not itself. That's really a remarkable difference. Yeah. I really help. Could Rod, could you do this section dealing with the radiation image? Yeah. That's certain radiation. It is necessary, therefore, the cause being immovable, that if anything secondary subsists after it, this second nature should be produced without the cause ever verging to it, or consulting, or in short, being moved. How, therefore, and what is it necessary to conceive about that abiding cause? We must conceive a surrounding splendor, proceeding indeed from this cause, but from it in a permanent state, like a light from the sun shining, and, as it were, running round it and being generated from it, the cause itself always abiding in the same immovable condition. All beings, likewise, as long as they remain, necessarily produce from their own receiving about themselves, and externally from the power which is present with them, a nature whose hypostasis is suspended from them, and which is, as it were, an image of the archetype from which it proceeded. Yeah. Does that, I don't see clearly why or how the image of the, of the temple and the image which is surround the temple in the tailor you see as a model for contemplation or how he's using that. I don't see that clearly. And I wondered if you might. Maybe I see it, I mean, but I don't think... <laughs> you know, you know. Or if I just see it, I don't think, I don't think, I, don't, I keep going back over it, and I keep thinking, well, it could be this way, and it could be this way. What translation do you have? I have the load in front of me here. Let's use it. Why don't you read from... Uh, Sorry, Beginning of that sentence. The one that we're talking about. The contemplator that yeah. sees God is inside. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Look. We're going to see whether we can. Clearly, he's talking about. Right. Someone doing. 
So, go ahead. Phrase by phrase, go ahead. The contemplator, then, mm -hmm. since God exists by himself as it's inside the temple. Hold on. Remaining quiet beyond all things, mm -hmm. must contemplate what images what must contemplate what correspond to the images already standing outside the temple. What is that? Mean? That he doesn't have the choice to look at the God inside the temple, so he That's has right. to take a look at the. Right. Yeah, how are they described? Yeah, what do you want to call that? That argument. Got it. Is it an argument? Is it an exploration philosophically of the point? Mm, doesn't look like a proof. Well, read it. Everything which is moved must have some end to which it is moved. Is that right? Is that an argument? Yeah. Everything like moves. Like a thesis statement. Anything moves. Uh huh. Like a theorem. No. No doubt. Well, it's. That, that's it, it's the first it's a statement of what is to be proved it looks like rather than proved about something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah but do you agree is it at this point obvious any is it sa talking about anything in motion yeah no what does it say though that it must have some end to which it moves there yeah. must be something to which the motion is no well, if what, wherever and whatever direction the thing is taken what can you say about it? That it, that it has to be some, some goal. Some goal. Some end. Yeah, go ahead. The one has no such end. All right, then he takes this and he says, by the way, the one, you can't attribute that kind of reasoning to the one. All right, agree? Mm-hmm. No, I can't, can't do that to the mm -hmm. one. Go ahead. So that we must not consider that it means. So, is that a conclusion? Is that an argument? Mm -hmm. ah, ah. What do you want to call it then? A philosophical argument? Yeah. And you've seen it before? Mm -hmm. Huh? Have I seen the argument before? Or things like that? Things like that? No. No. Mm -hmm. okay. We encountered this in the five leaders, right? Also in the Becoming for the sake of being, shipbuilding yeah. for the sake of ships. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Pardon? If anything comes into being after it, we must think that it necessarily does so while the one remains continually turned towards itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what was your question? My question was, how was this a model for <coughs> contemplation in that temple image? So, uh, how the image, how the image is in. So I, I'm uh, having trouble following the point you were making about motion before and how it, how it fits with the one. Can you do it again without the book? That um, motion must be towards some, any kind of motion must be towards some goal. Any oh, motion must oh. be towards a goal or an end. Yeah. Uh, any direction must be towards something. Yeah. But the one hasn't got such a goal mm -hmm. and, and therefore can't be said to move. What are you doing? What am I doing? Um, I'm taking that principle. We're trying to trying to well, see that principle with respect to see it. Mm -hmm. right, you're not merely recalling, you're, mm -hmm. you're not trying a memory trip mm -hmm. on this at this point. Mm -hmm. But you're trying to recall it and see it. Mm -hmm. That's contemplation. Mm -hmm. That's a model of contemplation. Mm -hmm. That's doing it. Mm -hmm. Right? You're doing it. Okay.
So what he's saying is that this is that kind of an argument that you need to contemplate, or one does contemplate rather than just reason. See, I don't like the word argument. <coughs> huh. Because the way in which you described it was something you were recalling and trying to see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a sense in which the word argument doesn't can, doesn't have that. Mm -hmm. right. So I call it philosophical reflection. And would you say that that uh, argument by immortality of the soul and the Phaedrus is in that same class? Is that class? Yeah. You'll see, just answered the question of um, doing it. Yeah. Yeah. That's not merely to be recalled, it's to be seen mm -hmm. as you recall. Mm -hmm. Active. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, now you said the tailor don't fit the Buddhist model? Well, watch what he, watch the Tom Kelly doing exactly the same thing. I'm saying he puts greater emphasis on this and makes it even clearer than this. Mm -hmm. It's pressing the last sounds. It is necessary, therefore, <coughs> that the beholder of him, being in himself, as if in the interior part of the temple and quietly abiding in an eminence beyond all things, should survey the statues, as survey the statues. which are established outwardly, or rather, that statue would first shine forth the view. Shines forth the view. And after the following manner, behold, that which is naturally adapted to be beheld. Naturally adapted to be beheld. If it is productive of insight, then it's naturally an object to be beheld. Okay. It's all in thread. Yes, okay. With respect to everything that is moved, <coughs> it is necessary there should be something to which it is moved. And this is, yeah, just a moment. this is where Plotinus gets his criticism from scholars. That <coughs> he may be bending language to suit that purpose. But as the counter argument goes, Yes, he may be inferior to, to many people who know more Greek than he does, but he's superior to them because he knows how to read Plato. Is that Taylor? Yeah, Tom. Um, you know, like mm -hmm. even if, even mm -hmm. it could be even if it could be shown to be a faulty translation, it could still be worth having. <coughs> As another Neoplatonist. In the, in the 19th century. We kind of a guided sub-reading of a more accurate word right there. <coughs> Just the, in the one point where he talks about the first image which appeared yeah. in, in the lobe, and Thomas Taylor says that would shine out, and so Thomas Taylor picks up the the way that the one is described in terms of the, the the radiant image that comes later, and that's fair from what this this Greek is. It's a word that's often translated as appear, but the image is of uh, shining out. So <coughs> it's real. That nugent. Who wants to use that word? <laughs> <Yeah, right>. oh, <laughs> really, really. <laughs> <laughs> meaning, but a kind of an awkward word. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So he does. He, it, doing it, yeah. he does a nice thing in terms of taking a later <laughs> image, and seeing how it's being used in an earlier passage, and then and then translating with it. How, how does we can do? But if we seek the vision of that great being within the inter inner sanctuary, self-gathered, tranquilly and remote above all else, we, be we begin by considering the images stationed at the outer precincts. <coughs> or more exactly, to the moment, 
the first image that appears. How the divine mind comes into being must be explained. Everything moving has necessarily an object towards which it advances. But since the Supreme can have no such object, we may not ascribe motion to it. Anything that comes into being after it can be produced only as a consequence of its unfailing Uh, but since the Supreme can have no such object, we may not ascribe motion to it. Anything that comes into being after it can be produced only as a consequence of its unfailing self-intention. And of course, we dare not talk of generation and time, dealing as we are with eternal beings. Where we speak of origin in such reference, it is in the sense merely of cause and subordination. Origin from the Supreme must not be taken to imply any movement in it. That would make the being resulting from the movement not a second principle, but a third, and movement would be the second hypostasis. Given this immobility in the Supreme, it can neither have yielded assent nor uttered decree nor stirred in any way towards the existence of a second, secondary. Do you want to attempt to get the No, he picks up the meditation, doesn't he, at this point? He continues it, doesn't he? Mm. <clears throat> what happened then? What are we to conceive as rising in the neighborhood of that immobility? It must be a circumradiation produced from the Supreme, but from the Supreme unaltering, and may be compared to the brilliant light encircling the sun and ceaselessly generated from that unchanging substance. All existences, as long as they retain their character, produce about themselves, from their essence, in virtue of the power which must be in them some necessity. Outward facing hypostasis continually attached to them and representing an image the engendering archetypes. Thus fire gives out its heat. Snow is cold, not merely to itself. Fragrant substances are a notable instance. For as long as they last, something is diffused from them and perceived wherever they are present. <clears throat> Again, all that is fully achieved engenders. Therefore, the eternally achieved engenders eternally in an, eternally be in an eternal being. At the same time, the offspring is always minor. What then are we to think of the all-perfect, but that it can produce nothing less and the very greatest that is later than itself. This greatest, later than the divine unity, must be the divine mind, and it must be the second of all existence, for it is that which sees the one on which alone it leans, while the first has no need whatever of it. The offspring of the prior to divine mind can be no other than the mind, that mind itself, and thus is the loftiest meaning in the universe, all else following upon it. The soul, for example, being an utterance and act of the intellectual principle, as that is an utterance and act of the world. But the soul but in soul the utterance is obscured, for soul is an image and must look to its own original. That principle, on the contrary, looks to the first without meditation, thus becoming what it is, and has that vision not from a distance, but as the immediate next, with nothing intervening, close to the one as soul to it. 
the offspring must seek and love the begetter, and the begetter and begotten are alone in their sphere, when, in addition, the begetter is the highest good. The offspring, inevitably seeking its good, is attached by a bond of sheer necessity, separated, separated only in being distinct. So, what do you want to call that? What you're doing for us. So you're still on that same thing. It's giving us one of the images in the outer precinct. Huh? That's all. So philosophical reflection. And in every way he's trying to show the connection between these, these two spirits, isn't it? appears and he says here the soul is an image and what follows the intelligence is first image would be soul mm -hmm. so and then back over on my favorite page 69 what to if if you were to take a look at the first image the soul then he would also be seeing that um, since the soul can rise above its condition again and turning to account the experience of what it has seen and suffered so the soul's giving an account of its experience, and that's the first. That would have to be um, part of the image that is first looked at. So it's like seeing. What do you say, seeing or knowing itself? What do you Discurs um, You're back on discursive. Well. That's okay. Dis having, I'm thinking discursive reasoning concerning the soul's experience and its account of its experiences. Discursive reasoning regarding Are the soul's Are you in the descent account. of the soul? Mm -hmm. Huh? Are you in the descent of the soul? Ascent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So anyway, it comes. Are you in section seven? Mm -hmm. um, hey, what you? Section seven in the descent of the soul. What page? In section six of. What page? Page sixty-nine. Because um, your voice trails off. I know. The um, oh. Souls referred to as an image, and it stands to reason that the first image would be the soul in that case, since it immediately follows the intelligence. The first image of one follows the soul. See, see look. Mm -hmm. Look, see. Mm -hmm. The same principles you'll find that exist here also exist here. Mm -hmm. Also exist here. Mm -hmm. With a difference, but it's always the same. Yeah. So, yes, you're right. The soul is an image. And the first image of the intelligence. Mm -hmm. Therefore, in the same way, the intelligence is to one. the first to the one. Right? So. Mm -hmm. Just keep that in mind because the point that you're making. I don't know if I can bring it all the way up to one, but. Yeah, okay, but the, the, that's good. But the points you're dealing with relate to to uh, this. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Where in this section he's dealing with this. Mm hmm. Right. 
So some of the things you'll be saying will fit because the same relationships exist between the first and the second as mm-hmm. between the second and the third. Yeah. But there's always a difference and that may cause some problems if you're trying mm-hmm. to attribute it to the section we're in. Mm-hmm. I suspect. I, it's the point, it's one of the things that we're into was the role of reflection. Was it not called a discursive reason? Mm-hmm. And that's a part of the intellect, isn't it? Mm-hmm. But when the incentive is in the sen- soul, he talks about it in the soul, doesn't he? Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's, sure, see, that's the count. difference. That's the difference where you're at. Everything up to that point is fine. When you go that, that it's in fact in the soul, then we can't use that when we talk about the first two categories. I'm not following. Well, just saying that, that the particular problem you may be having mm-hmm. is that you're looking at the what we're calling philosophical reflection is discursive reasoning, which is mm-hmm. a, which is a function of the soul, mm-hmm. because within the soul there is some place and something called the intelligence, mm-hmm. and therefore it's the lowest functioning of the mm-hmm. intelligence in the soul. Right, accounting its experiences. Right. Mm-hmm. And then the intelligence is discursive reasoning about those, taking those, say, it's, oh, forget it. I don't. I'm. I feel like I'm digging a hole. I'm sort of going to fall in this hole <laughs> and get covered up, so I think I just better think about this on my own. Since when is, is falling into a hole to be avoided? <laughs> I just don't want to have it be a public <coughs> spectacle as I do it. When you fall, you have to be alone. Yeah. All right, okay. The question is, will you fall alone? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Or if you do, will you know it? Which just the worst. Mm, find out. Ooh. It's the case of Bailey's. How are you going to find out? <laughs> you have to wait for the lady to laugh. How are you going to find out? Well, the only, the only thing that really through. set me off to talking <laughs> was this thing about the soul being an image, and then the idea of first image. That's the connection I made from there when I started talking. Maybe I should just stop there. Say, oh, the soul's an image. It must be the first image. Yeah, see, that's, that's the difficulty, you see. Yeah. Because, yes, it is true that it is an image. It's an image in the intelligence. The oh, I see. Way. I see what that relationship. But it's not the first yeah. image. Yeah. Okay. Intelligence is the first, first image. That waving of the hand made the connection. Left the realm of discourse. Made the connection, and we will then proceed on. <laughs> That's the point I was trying to uh-huh. make to you. The connections between each one of those realms is a constant. You have to mm-hmm. keep in mind the difference, otherwise you're going to be okay. the wrong level and attributing the wrong elements. Here. Mm-hmm. As you, you, I was thinking about the question you asked, what, what is this kind of contemplation like? It reminds me of those great, those Tibet um, meditations, those initiations, yeah. where they have you have meditate and, and have a, you know, Buddha that's golden, and mm-hmm. there's, these particular were images, but they had levels, mm-hmm. you know, going up. Each one was, this Buddha was sitting on a golden sun lotus, this Buddha was sitting on it. And they'd move you up level by level by level by level. Then they'd have you go to white light and dissolve them all down into each level by level down into the bottom. What was interesting, though, is that this is very comparable in the sense of you have the level by each, each level is described very specifically with certain specific functions and certain things that are and are not happening. So that, I just thought it's a fun... I, I don't understand the word just. <laughs> oh, I got embarrassed. I was kind of going, <laughs> feeling out. It's like Ruth. Ruth, we're in the hole together. <laughs> There's more than one person. But you're there for different reasons. Different reasons. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Chagrin. And you're laughing. <laughs> what do you mean? 
show something and pour crap on it. Yeah. yeah. No, it's just. Yeah. But the, it, this is. Finish your place. Much uh, more fun in a, in a sense, although because there's not the uh, image, but just the pure the pure relationship. There are images, yeah. but not like pictographic. And they're secondary. And they're secondary to what it is that you're contemplating. Right. And the other is idea. Mm -hmm. And it has very little thought. Very little thought. Right. Okay, how does the one produce the second? Without assent, decree, or movement of any kind. How? See? How? How? That's where we're at, isn't it? <coughs> See, that's this. All right, you put it in the koan if you want, put it into metaphysics if you want, put it in contemplation over here. It doesn't make any difference. So, how, how does he pull it off? When we were doing the Republic, we found eight of these. We did one night. A whole bunch of them. Eight of eight. Eight. Well, the image that he uses here, how does it produce? He said, hey, wait a minute. It's like this. Sun, without doing anything in itself, right. what does it do? Radiant. Radiant, right? And he's saying, right, the one is to the intelligent being as the sun is to the light. Right? That's what we said. And, and if you talk about how you ignore the top and you expand what he means by this, then you attribute it to thus. So from that, the sun doesn't uh, doesn't uh, act to produce the life. And what's another way in which we can talk about this? You remember the old language we used in the Republic and other works? Perfection. Yeah. Also, uh, function. Nature function. All things when it comes to perfection produce. And when it comes in, when it's perfect, it's perfect, it produces. Nature function. When something is mature and it reached its level of perfection, there is a natural function. Right? Nature function. Um, is it that, that statement about perfection is right out of the Prophets? Yeah, the Prophets right just using Prophets. These out. Yeah. One reader, please. He says, well, the statement I've seen here it comes up a number of times, and it seems to be somewhat central to this issue is that all things may come to perfection produce. Right. The one is always perfect and therefore produces everlasting. Where Propolis says, whatever is perfect tends to produce those things which it's capable of producing, right. imitating in its turn the one and originated principle of the universe. Well, exactly where it comes from. So, if, okay, if you were doing it, if you were doing this, then that kind of physics you would have in your mind, that background you would have in your mind, that's what you'd be doing. And that's called contemplating the one. By doing what? By contemplating its images in the outer precinct. Okay. So, how? Okay, we're back on the how. Right. That's, an answer to the, that's an answer to the how. Look at that, will you? 
copy. You mean how the images got there? Um, no. Uh, in the beginning of six, uh, there are several hows in the questions that he's posing. <coughs> And right where we are, how are we to conceive this sort of generation and its relation to its immovable cause? How are we to conceive this? Right? He's doing it. How are, we, how are we to contemplate it? How are we to conceive it? He's saying, I'll tell you how to do it. Consider this image here. The sun stands to light. Right? Notice what he says about it. We are to conceive it as a radiation that though it proceeds from the one leaves itself stainless, undisturbed, much in the way of the brilliance that encircles and is ceaseless, ceaselessly generated by the sun does not affect its self same and unchangeable existence. Mm. So, all right, he's, he's dealing with this part of the analogy. He's using terms that belong above it, so it carries you with it, doesn't it? Self, sanity, eternal. So that's the answer to the how. How does it do it? Oh, just in that way. Just in that way. Mm -hmm. So we could put here, superimpose the one, <coughs> and for the radiating lights, we could put intelligence beam. Is that that's what it's where it is? Something or something. Right. The how, the how is the light is like the sun. How is like the sun? The answer to the how would be like the sun. In what way? How what? Uh, how what? The original. Um, I thought it was to help the original question. Well, I guess it would be how how does it come? How did it come into existence? So, and the he is what? Mm -hmm. How did he come into existence? It 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 comes into existence. Uh, as light did. No no no. What's the antecedent? What's he talking? About? Um, uh, I think intelligence. Great. Right. Then how did it come into existence? Like light does from the sun. Okay. And if it did that, then what would it be like? Like light. Right. You said there were eight. In, we did eight in the Republic, and I, I didn't see that that I understood eight. What in the Republic with respect to that? Did, and I'd like to know what you were referring to. I know that you talked about we we, we went to the idea of progress and perfection, and and but I I don't know whether. So what were you referring to when you said in the Republic? One is, day there, we is, there, is there some kind of connection between the sun and light? Uh-huh. Yes. Could you call it a union? Okay. Yeah. Does he talk about that yeah. in the sixth book of the Republic? Definitely. And there are many such unions? Yes. And another one is between sight, right? sight in uh -huh. the eyes? Mm -hmm. So, so, we got, yeah, okay. so we got a list of, of the levels of those unions. That's saying, yeah. Okay. okay. All the way up to the good and the ugly. Great. Good. That was the last Thank you. Summer. That was the last song. The last, last song. We laid out that. No, I think so. I was asking myself where I was. <laughs> Thanks. Well, the same principle is that uh, Chinese thought really expresses this in such 
drill succinctness. They call that structural principle of structural similarity. Structural similarity. There's a certain relationship that exists in the nature of reality, and it permeates all such relations. The relationship between the sun and light is the same relation between father and mother, king and queen, king, right, and his country. And you can push that all the way up philosophically like we're doing now. The relations are constant, but the terms vary. Ever heard that before? Mm -hmm. Principle of structural similarity. Mm -hmm. right. Could they hear that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that in Chinese. <laughs> I have a question on page 98. Um, I'm sure you're glad you got us there. We were stuck on 97 for so long. We're getting embarrassed. So. <laughs> so what becomes perfect becomes productive. Now, it's... He must be talking about the intelligence because one is perfect. It has nowhere to go other than being the one. <laughs> so the what becomes perfect would be intelligence. Perfect. The one is perfect. Right. But it's not going to become perfect. Well, the soul becomes perfect. perfect when it's with this perfect one. Yeah. Want to flip for it? Hmm? Well, you got the one that is, and she's talking about becoming perfect, and right. the thing that becomes perfect is the soul right. when it's with the one. Right, the fact that you're saying the soul. <laughs> That's all right, just so long as you know when you're there. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, if you put emphasis on the idea of if it becomes perfect, then you're quite right. You must be talking about something that has that perfectibility, or the capability of perfectibility. Is that the point? Yeah. 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 That's true. Yeah. What does become perfect becomes productive. Mm -hmm. So if we s are we talking about the intelligence here? We're talking, talking about both. Or, or many. Or, or anything. Structural similarity. Read the next sentence. Mm -hmm. Eternally perfect is eternally productive. And what it produces is eternal too, although it's inferior. That principle runs through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Runs throughout all nature, runs throughout all reality. From the highest to the lowest. So there's a different did there's different levels of perfection? No, perfection is the same, but it operates on different levels and therefore you can be talking about perfection in different levels. Can you give me an example? Male and female, when they mature sufficiently, they can then conceive. They can just then uh, generate, can they not? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a perfection of their body, doesn't it? Gets to that point. Well, yeah, this, what I was thinking up here is the midwifery giving birth. Okay, so that's the same principle on the world. Okay. Physically, uh, I guess you could go cosmically and say, when all of the elements come together to produce a sun, for it to be functioning as a sun, then at that moment it's perfect. Then it produces life, its offspring. Mm -hmm. We'll get that same principle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. How about reading the next next line, the next couple of lines? Answer it there. And you'll see. Go ahead. What then are we to say of that which is supremely perfect? It produces only the very great that are less than it. Right. Okay. What is most perfect after it is the second hypostasis, the intelligence. The intelligence contemplates the one and needs nothing but the one. 
The one, however, has no need of the intelligence. The one, superior to the intelligence, produces the intelligence. The best after the one, since it is superior to all the others. So it's saying, which is all there. Then at that moment, you're comfortable. That's contemplation. Make those connections. So if you understand it, you can't help but do it. Oh, you produce by necessity. Can't help it. Ah. So you have a functioning mind and you're following this. You make the connection at that moment. What are you doing? Same. The same. That's contemplation. The same insight contemplation are all the same. Same oh. is contemplation. It's the same. Same with the mind. Okay. Is that a production? Well, isn't it? It gave birth inside. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. And without moment of insight, it's bringing mm-hmm. together all the pieces. Mm-hmm. That's seeing, beholding. Hmm. Okay. By heaven, I knew we'd get through this. And we can add images to our picture if we wanted to go further into this. Uh, but I'm assuming that we can get it if we need it. So, seven, were we not going to speed our way through this whole thing tonight? No. Didn't it? Mm-hmm. Remember? Mm-hmm. Remember that what we said? The fruit is so sweet, we just want to move it. I was sure we were going to get into Anaxagoras tonight, but you know what? Anaxagoras? Oh. I Empedocles mean, in the form of degustation. Anaxagoras in the form of I'll tell you what, we'll keep on going so long as Ruth is willing to be the master of uh, Section 11. Is that fair? Is that the descent of the soul? No. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Discursive reasoning. <laughs> discursive reasoning, that's the one. Actually, you know Discursive reasoning. Okay. Now, in this beautiful picture, what do you see there, Ron? Picture. Of what? Of the one. And what? Yeah, well, what kind of it's a mirror? In a mirror. Oh, in a mirror. Right. 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 Okay. Sorry, Ron. Right. Well, it's a mirror. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a window. <laughs> well, it was so clear. Yeah. I couldn't let you get a D. <laughs> God. Reflection. It's got to see itself. Which book are we reading? Charge? Yes. Well, we say that intellect is an image of that good, so we must speak more plainly. Glad to hear it. I'll try. First of all, we must say that what has come into being must be, in a way, that good, and retain much of it and be a likeness of it, as light is of the sun. But intellect is not that good. How then does it generate intellect? Because by its return to it, it sees. And this seeing is intellect. Mom sees, ah, intelligence. For that which apprehends something else is either sense perception or intellect. Sense perception is a line, etc. I suppose that's added by 
But the circle is of a kind which can be divided. But this is not so. There is one here also, but the one is the productive power of all things. The things then of which it is the productive power are those which intellect observes in a way cutting itself off from the power, otherwise it would not be intellect. For intellect also has of itself a kind of intimate perception of its power, that it has power to produce substantial reality. Intellect certainly, by its own means, even defines its being for itself by the power which comes from the one, because its substance is a kind of single part of what belongs to the one and comes from the one, it is strengthened by the one and made perfect in substantial existence by and from it. But intellect sees by means of itself like something divided proceeding from the undivided. That life and thought and all things come from the one because that God is not one of all things. For this is how all things come from him. Because he is not confined by any shape, that one is one alone. If he was all things, he would be numbered among beings. For of this reason, that one is none of the things in the intellect, but all things come from him. This is why they are substances, for they are already defined, and each has a kind of shape. Being must not fluctuate, so to speak, in the indefinite, but must be fixed by limit and stability. And stability in the intelligible world is limitation and shape. And it is by these that it receives existence. Of this lineage is this intellect of which we are speaking, a lineage worthy of the purest intellect, that it should spring from nowhere else but the first principle. And when it has come into existence, it should generate all realities along with itself, all the beauty of the ideas and all the intelligible gods. It is full of the beings which it has generated and, as it were, swallows them up again by keeping them in itself. And because they do not fall out into matter and are not brought up in the house of Rhea, as the mysteries and the myths about the gods say, riddling that Kronos, the wisest god, before the birth of Zeus, took back and kept within himself all that he begat, and in this way is full and is intellect in satiety. And after this they say he begat Zeus, who is then his, that is, boy in satiety. For intellect generates soul, since it is perfect intellect. For since it was perfect, it had to generate and not be without offspring when it was so great a power. But its offspring could not be better than it. This is not so, even here below. But had to be a lesser image of it. And in the same way, indefinite. <clears throat> but defined by its parents and, so to speak, given a form. And the offspring of intellect is a rational form and an existing being, that which thinks discursively. It is this which moves round intellect and its light and trace of intellect and dependent on it, united to it on one side, and so filled with it and enjoying it, and sharing in it, and thinking. But on the other side, in touch with the things which came after it, or rather itself generating 
what must necessarily be worse than soul. About these we must speak later. This is as far as the divine realities extend. Very interesting. This is this, of course, is what uh, this is the, the heresy, right? This is the heresy, right there. The Christians got right. Put the one. What did they put in? God. The son. The son. Mm -hmm. right. God the Father. Mm -hmm. right. The Son. Mm -hmm. Holy God. <coughs> but but uh, this is where they departed. This is what caused the Nicene Creed. This is what caused all the controversies. And this is what produced the Dark Ages. Because they insisted that uh, there is, there are these three primary relations of the Trinity, but what does it violate? It violates that one principle. That in the production, that in the production, the product is inferior. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and when it's full and perfect, it produces something. And whatever it produces out of the fullness of its being, there's always two. Christianity has to say, no, these are three in one and there is no difference. And that did away with Greek philosophers right there. Well, Boy, I tell you, I ne no one could ever explain that to me. Well, because me either. I, I St. Augustine, Augustine how could three be one? St. Augustine made it quite clear. He said the reason we argue this way is because it's beyond, it is beyond the criticism of reason and the philosophers. Well, that's the way you say it. That's what he said. That's he said, we wanted to have a faith that was beyond, beyond doubt, beyond criticism. Just sound like my dad. Don't <laughs> question me. <laughs> yeah, don't question me. Just make it up, make it internally on something. I'm going to read that work just with the Trinitaria. That's yeah. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. You know, it's, it's an argument why the three are one. Yeah. Well, it can't be. No, no, it can't be intelligent. Yeah. No, it can't. It's not living. <laughs> well, because you can't say three things, one one produces from the other, it keeps producing from the other in sequence. If they're all the same. If they're all the same. That's like three ones. Right? <laughs> now we have three ones. The first one, by the way, is different from the second. In no respect are they different now. <laughs> really. The second is different from the third. You know, proceeded from the second. It never did that at all because it's all the same. <laughs> what? You open your mouth and talk, Jack. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. <laughs> Shut up. But if they made it rational in some way, then there'd be no need for it. <laughs> <Excuse me. laughs> that's what Eckhart tries to do, isn't it? Mm -hmm. the, the logos in between uh, God and man. Yeah, well, the word is, is Jesus for him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he, he reaches for a fourth. Meister Eckhart pulled the whole uh, uh -huh. The Godhead. The God, uh -huh. And the Godhead is above all three. So he made a higher uh -oh. in the Trinity. Uh -oh. Whoa. Uh, Boy, made, that's why they got rid of his. Chopped him up. Yeah. yeah. They well, raced to get him to he bring him to the Inquisition, and the guy died. So they dug up his body and scattered it all over the countryside. They were so mad at it. <laughs> Didn't get to kill him. After he Didn't died. Didn't get, get to kill him. They were after him. But he wanted a one then. He yeah, that's what he did. Yeah. He said, whatever is cohesive in that, the, that trinity. Right. That's something. Else. Whatever unifies them must be higher than any one of its parts. Mm -hmm. oh. Godhead. <laughs> <laughs> and the others must be its subsidiary. Right? Ooh. <laughs> well, that would get them. So here you have it. After that Zeus problem, you know, the, the way he understands mythology. Yeah, well, when he said Cronus held everything in, but, but he couldn't hold everything in because he produced Zeus. 
of all of his conceptions. Um, everything in intelligence is already contained within him. Oh, I see. It brings him forth that it contains him. <laughs> yeah. And see, you can see the same the same structure in uh, O'Brien in 99. Thus the intelligence out of its fullness begets the soul. Right? It begets necessarily because it's perfect. Being so great a power, it cannot remain sterile. Here again, the begotten had to be inferior an image. Now there's the heresy. What is begotten by something perfect must necessarily be less than, than its author, the author of its being. Early Christians saw this, they went up and smiled. They had to redefine the Trinity so that it couldn't come out it couldn't come out this way. They didn't want it to come out this That's why the seven last seven words of Jesus Christ were always interesting to bring out. Okay. Yeah, if they're equal, why is he <laughs> Saying those words. Those lessons. Oh, I'm so forsaken. Yeah, you know you're going to rise from the dead. Still the same? Wait a minute. How come I'm here and you're up there? Oh, yeah. Wait a minute. How come I'm here and you're up there? Oh, yeah. Hey, if we're equal, why am I here? How come I got nailed to the cross? Why do I feel forsaken? I don't mind being there. Yeah. Well, knowing in a couple of days you're going to be out of it. Well, he had too much sin. He had everyone's sin. That's why he was persecuted. I mean, how's he going to do that? How's he going to take everybody's sin? <laughs> I never. No, no, I'm perfect. Give me your sin. Does that make you imperfect? How does that, how does that work? Obviously, it did, or else God would have recognized it. Because he, he took everyone else's sin. Then we don't have any. We'll be. It didn't help any because all my life they said I was a sinner. <laughs> right? He took it all, except I still got some. Now what happened? Yeah. See, so what the intelligence begets is a word and substantive reason. The being that moves about the intelligence and is the light of the intelligence, the ray that springs from it. On the other hand, it is bound to the intelligence, fills itself with it, enjoys its presence, shares in it, as itself in intellectual existence. Right? So he's, he's also in that got the connection back again. So therefore the soul finds its fullness in and enjoys the presence of intelligence. Right? Shares in it. And so because it in itself is an intellectual existence, because it came from it, it sprang from it. Yeah, so it's it's all that very loving. Yeah, it's it. very loving. Right. And that same loving image is between the first two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a little old. You can see the price tag on it. It says 95 cents. Yeah, that's oh, yeah. That's a, well, I have some Play-Dohs that have 50 cents. <laughs> <laughs> you had some lobes that were pretty expensive. $3.15.
find them. Yeah, horse glue. Like, mm. What is that? Ruddy yeah, paste. Yeah. Ruddy? That's what it's called. Ruddy paste. R E D D? Yeah. It's a lot of term used by. Ruddy paste. Don't smell so good either. I did that to whitehead ones. Maybe those old whitehead bones? All the time. Yeah, hard down. They're not too good. Well, what do you say? Ruth, want to read eight? <laughs> sure. At least one paragraph. Okay. This is the reason why Plato establishes three degrees of reality. He says, it is in relation to the king of all and on his account that everything exists. In relation to a second, the second class of things exists, and in relation to a third, the third class. Further, he speaks of the father of the cause, by cause meaning the intelligence, because for him the intelligence is the demiurge. He adds that it is this power that forms the soul in the mixing bowl. The good, he says, the existent that is superior to the intelligence, and superior to being, is the father of the cause, i.e. of the intelligence. Several times he says that idea is being and the intelligence. That the intelligence completes the good. And the soul These indeed are not new doctrines. They have been taught in the most ancient times, without, however, being made fully explicit. Our claim is to be no more than interpreters of these earlier doctrines whose antiquity is attested by Plato's writings. Thing he's adding anything, is it? No, but it jumps off his own. Substantive. Yeah, right. No new concepts. 